This week's blog post is on American portraits at the Worcester Art Museum. It's part one. For more on the Worcester Art Museum, see the first post in this series. In this post, we look at the earliest American paintings at the Worcester Art Museum and see how they compare with the European ones that we looked at over the last few weeks. Our first example dates to around 1670 and is by the Freak Gibbs painter. The stark black and white of John Freak's outfit is reminiscent of those worn in Cornelis van der Voort's husband and wife portraits of 1617. As with those Dutch burghers, the solemn colors are worn for religious reasons. Boston, the home of the Freaks, was Puritan territory. Like the Dutch burghers, John and Mary managed to display their wealth anyway via features such as John's elaborate lace collar. His wife, isn't she daring, is wearing a few red ribbons on her sleeve. The style of the Freaks Gibbs painter is very different from Van der Voort's, with distinct outlines rather than carefully three-dimensional modeling. Look, for example, at the way the hands are represented. On the left, the Freak Gibbs painter shows you every finger, whole, and on the right, Van de Voort shows angles. It doesn't show you the whole hand, but you assume that it's there. So what is going on here? Scholars have proposed that the Freak's Gibbs painter was an untrained artist, meaning a folk artist, or an itinerant Dutch painter from New York, or a painter in the Elizabethan English style. According to the Worcester Art Museum site, at the moment, scholars are leaning toward the Elizabethan option because Elizabethan painters focused on linear forms and surface ornamentation. Nicholas Hilliard painted portraits of Elizabeth I and her contemporaries. They appear in pretty much every major survey of art history. One of them is on the right. Hilliard said, quote, Forget not, therefore, that the principal part of painting or drawing after the life consisteth in the truth of the line. For the line without shadow showeth all to good judgment, but shadow without line showeth nothing. The Elizabethan style of painting began to fade in England when Anthony van Dyck, that's an example of his work on the right, arrived in England in 1632. But the Elizabethan style persisted for decades more in English outposts such as Boston. The Freak Gibbs painter produced about 10 portraits, all of them dated around 1670 to 1674, and all of them of Bostonians. The next work dates to around 1680, and it's by Thomas Smith. Compared to the Freak family portraits, which were painted about a decade earlier, Smith's portrait is a little more three-dimensional, but there's still some emphasis on line rather than volume. Like John Freak, Smith wears sober black, and like Freak, the lace, lace collar shows that Smith is not a poor man. Smith adds two explicitly religious elements to his self-portrait. The first is the skull on which his hand rests. It's called a memento mori, a reminder of death. And there's also a poem on the paper beneath the skull that explicitly rejects this world in favor of God. I've given you a link to the transcription of that. According to the Worcester Art Museum site, this right here is the earliest known American self-portrait and the only known 17th century New England portrait by an artist who can be identified, meaning the others are known, at, known as the Freak's Gibbs painter, for example, after the people that he painted, but we don't know the guy's actual name. Judging from the naval battle visible through the window, Smith at some point had a naval career, but we don't know anything else about him. Next up, circa 1763, a portrait by Copley. We are skipping ahead 80 years to John Singleton Copley, 1738 to 1815, who grew up in Boston and was exposed to art quite early. His stepfather was a painter and engraver, and by the 1750s and 1760s, wealthy Bostonians owned some art. Copley was painting portraits by age 14. He soon set a new standard for portraiture in the British colonies, showing character as well as physical appearance of his sitters. This portrait, painted when Copley was 25, looks informal but is in fact carefully composed. His sitter relaxes and stares into space, an open book in his hand. Boers's pose is in sharp contrast to the formality of Sarah Tyler, 
that's at the upper right. This is also at the Worcester Art Museum. Both of these two were painted at about the same time. We learned something about each of those sitters just by how they chose to sit in their portraits. Even in his 20s, when he painted this portrait, Copley was a virtuoso at representing textures, and he didn't represent them just for the sake of showing off. Boers is wearing a drab olive brown, but the fabric is clearly velvet, which tells us, as surely as a lace collar, that he's wealthy. The Boers portrait is from the same decade as the portrait we saw in European portraits, Francis Coates, William Sixth Baron Craven. Copley is a pretty decent painter, and not just for a colonial. Over the next few years, Copley created such notable works as Paul Revere and The Boy with Flying Squirrel. But relations between the American colonies and Britain were becoming increasingly tense, and in 1774, Copley decamped to London. There he studied British portraiture and painted increasingly accomplished portraits, such as Mrs. Fort, who is now in the Wadsworth Athenaeum. Copley never returned to America. And the last one for this week, which dates to around 1779. Bet you wouldn't have guessed that this portrait was painted 16 years or so after that Copley portrait that we just looked at. At age 18, Edward Savage, 1761 to 1817, another Massachusetts native, decided to do a three by two foot family portrait that includes his parents, brothers, sister, and grandfather. Savage himself stands with his palette at the far left. I can't fault his ambition, but those carefully studied heads are bizarrely large in proportion to the bodies and the black and white checkered floor seems to ripple. By 1796, after studying with Benjamin West in London, Savage was capable of producing this portrait of George Washington and his family. It's a considerable improvement. Next week, we will look at some more American portraits at the Worcester Art Museum. A word on why I'm doing this series. For the Resurrecting Romanticism Conference in October 2023, I am working on a talk on art at the 1893 Chicago World's Fair, also known as the Columbian Exposition. One of the questions I'll be addressing is why the organizers of the exposition and the painters whose works appeared there were so very keen to surpass the buildings and the exhibitions at the 1889 Paris World's Fair. To remind myself of the development of European and American painting over time, this series of posts is a quick overview of European portraits from the Renaissance to the 19th century and then American portraits. If the history of Western painting interests you, check out my Innovators in Painting, a 140-page survey that focuses on innovations that gave painters more power to make their viewers stop, look, and think about paintings. DianeDurantiWriter.com has hundreds of posts on sculpture, painting, architecture, and my other obsessions. To join the Sunday Recommendations email list, visit the URL that's on the screen or email me. And you can say, well done, Diane, or support my work and receive rewards by means of the tip jar on DianeDurantiWriter.com. As always, thank you for listening.